Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends, and colleagues. Welcome to this afternoon's keynote lecture event at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy Festival of Ideas. It is a pleasure to have all of you here, and additionally, a great honor indeed for me to get to welcome Dr. Sri Mulyani Indrawati, Her Excellency the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia. Dr. Sri Mulyani will be delivering the keynote lecture concerning the topic, challenges and opportunities for Asia's leadership in the coming years. Before I welcome her to the rostrum, please allow me to say a few words. Dr. Sri Mulyani as you, is, as you know, the Minister of Finance of Indonesia, a position she has served in since 2016, but also before then, from 2005 through 2010. If you're doing that quick calculation in your head, you will then realize that those dates where she has been Minister of Finance cover some of the riskiest, most challenging, most exciting moments in the life of the global economy. Not least among them, the 2008 global financial crisis. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, under Dr. Sri Mulyani's economic leadership, Indonesia generated economic growth of over 4%. Indonesia, together with the two other populous Asian economies, China and India, helped keep the global economy afloat through that dangerous episode. Through all this, and longer term, Dr. Sri Mulyani has fought corruption, strengthened Indonesia's economy, raised foreign exchange reserves, reduced public debt, and helped reinforce an Indonesia of integrity, of economic credibility, of financial stability, thereby attracting to Indonesia's economy ever greater flows of investment, both foreign and domestic. Dr. Sri Mulyani is by training an economist and has shown outstanding public service not just in her own nation, but around the world. Before becoming Indonesia's finance minister in 2005, Dr. Sri Mulyani had served as executive director on the IMF board. In 2010, in a development that was viewed around our planet as Indonesia's loss and the world's gain, Dr. Sri Mulyani took up the position of managing director of the World Bank Group. Dr. Sri Mulyani has won countless awards and been widely acknowledged. Among those awards, Euromoney Finance Minister of the Year, Emerging Markets Asia Finance Minister of the Year, Forbes Top 40 list of most powerful women in the world, World Government Summit's best minister in the world. We are all grateful indeed that she's back in Indonesia, back in ASEAN, and we all look forward to her continued public service. I hope you will join me in welcoming Dr. Sri Mulyani to deliver the keynote. Thank you, Professor Kwa. Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, fellow students, future leaders in Asia, and all other honorable guests. It's a very good afternoon to all of you and thank you for inviting me here. It is an honor to be at your inaugural flagship event, Festival of Ideas. I always enjoy coming to festivals, especially when they generate innovative ideas and solutions. I like the concept of this event, designed to be a marketplace of new ideas filled with stimulating discussion to meet the public policy challenges of our time. I would also like to congratulate the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy for its 15th year's anniversary. The namesake of this school carries the legacy of a leader who transformed this country from third world to first in a single generation. There are lessons to extract here. If you study in this institution, please consider yourself extremely fortunate. 
to be in one of the best public policy schools in Asia. Over the course of 15 years, this school has become a center of excellence in the region, preparing the next generation of leaders in Asia and improving the standard of governance along the way. The theme of the festival, Governance for the Future, Asia's perspective is definitely very relevant. The world is rapidly changing. Thus, we must ask thought-provoking question on the challenges and opportunities that the future leaders of Asia would face in the coming years. One thing we should always remember is that the most important word in public policy is public. The emphasis is on the people that will be affected through the choice leaders and policy makers make. This is the key essence of public service particularly in a more complex world where public policy transcends traditional boundaries. When I graduated, public policy was all about government. But today, we enter a world full of many more options and actors. We can be involved with public policy while working for civil society organization the media, the private sector, for example, like tech company or development institution. Whatever our sectors might be, it is important to keep in mind that when we try to influence public policy making, it is going to affect the well-being of many people. Every generation has policy issues based on their concern and the context they live in. As a policymaker, as mentioned by Dean Kua, I have to be constantly on my toes and be cognizant about issue the public care about most. Even as an experienced minister in the span of more than 15 years, I always think and find and feel that the environment that we are working is constantly changed and the change is very rapid. As a policymaker, that reminds me that we cannot take for granted even the knowledge and the experience that we have. So for me, I always remind myself that to be in service to our nation is both an honor and a privilege. So I always aim to give my best and nothing but my best. To bring the topic much closer to us, today I will focus on the challenges and opportunities that the future leaders of Asia would face in the coming years. The region is dynamic and its future presents great opportunities and challenges. Thus, the leaders in Asia have to be agile and mindful of the changing trend issues. I will construct my speech into several parts the first part will give the context of the current global economic environment. I do understand that you have Tom Friedman before me, so you must have a very updated discussion about the current global uh, environment. But I would like to also see how this includes the impact to our region as well as to Indonesia as the biggest economy in Southeast Asia. The second one, I will touch upon the challenges of leadership in the future by taking into consideration the transformation and trends with respect to geopolitics, technology, equality, and inclusion. And third, I will share a bit on the public policy response, especially in my own country, Indonesia, to bring us to become the aspiration of high-income country uh, in the next three decades. And more broadly, I hope my perspective will positively stimulate your discussion and provide additional food for thought for your festival of ideas. Let me start with the current global environment and what it means for our regions. Asia has been an engine of global growth and beacon of stability in the last few decades. 
What Asia has collectively achieved in economic development has been extraordinary. Other regions are looking at our approaches to development, our track record in lifting so many people out of poverty, and our ability to boost prosperity in this dynamic part of the world. In fact, if I can add, my experience working as a managing director in charge for operation of the World Bank gave me the real perspective that many country, many region look at this region with such an envy, how this region can progress and create prosperity, alleviating people from poverty and creating a shared prosperity in a constant decade after decade. This is something that maybe for many of us living in Asia taken for granted, but I can really guarantee you, if you travel in many different parts of the world, such an achievement is not a guarantee. It's such a unique achievement. As I said, our region looking at our approaches of development. China, India, and also Indonesia still has the highest growth rate among the G20. Japan, South Korea, and Singapore were able to leap into high income status in merely several decades. Moreover, the Asia region has shown its resilience during times of crisis in the past. The global economy has experienced a downward trend, particularly this year, 2019. The IMF World Bank has revised down its projection and estimated that the global economy will only grow at 3% this year. This is 0.6% lower than last year. And this is also the lowest growth since the global financial crisis 10 years ago. In addition, the global trade volume is projected to grow only at 1.1% in 2019. This is significantly lower compared to 3.6% last year, or if you compare even before the global financial crisis. ASEAN cannot escape from the impact of weak demand and lower manufacturing activity. Despite this global uncertainty, developing Asia economic growth is still expected to grow by 5.9% this year, lower from 6.4% last year. China economic slowdown has certainly impacted most of ASEAN economy that heavily rely on trade with China. Therefore, the continued deceleration of China economy will certainly impact manufacturing, investment, and trade in much of Asia. This region still need this engine to work well to ensure productivity and job creation. The trade war between the US and China, the world's two biggest economies, has been one of the most significant factors creating global economic uncertainty and also impacting Asia economies as a whole. But we should never lose sight that for Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, the potential of these regions are enormous. Asia is home to around 4.6 billion people or 60% of the global population with abundant natural resources and unique diversities. To optimize these advantages, ASEAN has to step up its game through structural reform, building competitiveness, and driving productivity. In light of this ever-evolving global trend, let me touch upon some of the challenges and opportunities that the future leaders in Asia would face in the coming years. There is no better venue to speak of this very topic than at this school, an institution that produces future leaders and policymakers in the region. The future leadership challenges can be insurmountable. However, this should not dissuade the young generation to enter public service. 
This generation has to figure out how to create meaningful livelihood in the post-industrial world where technology and affordability fast communication creates unlimited possibility. This generation is the first to feel the impact of climate change and the security concern of the future will be different. They are asymmetrical, unpredictable, and a lot more complex. We are already seeing how small violent groups can create havoc, cause human suffering, and divide the normal definition of nation states. We are now living in multipolar world, and we are all connected. In this global village, people, business, capital, technology, information, and knowledge are spreading beyond, beyond boundaries. But regardless of what generation we are, people across generations want the same things, prosperity and dignity, equality of opportunity as well as justice and security. The only thing that changes is their context. Today, all of us have access to instant information from a smartphone with data practically at everyone's fingertips. No country is truly isolated. No matter how much some government want to insulate themselves from the global public. This generation is living through the democratization of knowledge. But the irony is that with more access to more information than ever, people have not become more open-minded. This generation's challenge is not the availability and accessibility of information. This is what I always continuously emphasize when I teach in the University of Indonesia, my student depend and different from my generation. When we only have one library, we sometimes have to wait and queue for borrowing a book. Today, this generation have all the availability of reverence at a very convenience in their fingertips. So their challenge is not availability and access, but the choice one make when you seek it out. Instant access to information has become a lot easier to confirm one's own assumption and stereotype by blending out the other side. It now takes more effort to reach across the lines of division and understand the people one do not agree with. Usually in the past, we read newspaper in which they try to always present a different point of view for a certain issue. The function of the editors is just making sure that they are going to get all those views in the one article. Today, if you access on the website, and you know exactly the website that is your preference, they are usually just justifying what you have already have in mind. So it's becoming very difficult to make conversation in public, even though we have technology and have the accessibility. So this kind of contact plays into the hands of populists who shout louder, who see all problem as black and white, who exploit fears and other magic solution to complex issue. Believe me, as a finance minister, usually our job is saying that we have resource which is limited, we need to be very prudent, we talk about sustainability. So there are a lot of trade-off trade in the policy, but it is so difficult to actually facing with many issue that saying that I have the magic bullet to solve all Indonesian problem without money or without paying tax or without working. It's so difficult. So this is, make, this is making the job 
as a policymakers in the future or even today so much more challenging. The terrain for future leaders and policymakers are indeed more challenging. First and foremost, within society, there will be a different interest. Thus, public institutions must strike a balance in governing to achieve optimum impact for society. Furthermore, with more instant access to information and policy making dynamic, the public is more impatient and people get angry quickly because, they beca because their expectations are high and they want delivery as fast as an instant message. Leaders and policy makers could get overwhelmed in the process because of this 24-7 accountability cycle, enabled by democracy, by social media, and by increased openness. The relationship between leaders and policy makers with the constituent they represent could be very challenging in the future. Given this trend, we need to think about an effective response and platform to help leaders and policymakers exercise their duty effectively. In meeting these challenges, the legal framework might need to be re-emphasized, outlining all the rights and responsibility of all parties. This includes citizens and their representatives, including the leaders and policymakers that are entrusted to make decisions on their behalf. Furthermore, institutions need to be flexible enough to constantly adapt to this changing trend and social dynamic. A system needs to strike a balance between being open and inclusive with its ability to be decisive and effective in policy making and its delivery. Good leadership will know how to navigate and respond to this changing dynamic. The leaders and policymakers need certainly be competent, full of integrity and passionate in serving the public. Their ability to articulate and explain policy decision is in an open and participatory manner is also key. So what does it take to become a good leaders and policymakers? My point of view, first, technical competence is non negotiable in order to take informed decision. Together with good judgment, it helps policymakers understand the trade-off, the merit and demerit of every decision. But most importantly, it allows policymakers to identify winners and losers on how to address their issue. Even if policymakers are convinced of the quality of the policy not everyone will benefit immediately. This is true for every country, whether you are rich country, middle income, or low income country. It affects people's life in very real ways. And just because the policy make sense and the number add up, it does not mean it works. You actually can see it now. You see it in Chile, who only increased very small fraction of the tariff, and the response of the people is just totally surprising for the policymaker. You see it in many different forms, in many different worlds. So for leaders and policymakers, sometimes the best option cannot be implemented. Even in a crisis, which I've been through, for example, 97, 98, financial crisis, ASEAN financial crisis, and 2008, 2009. In that particular situation, sometimes what is available is the least bad, least bad option. You don't have the luxury of first best, second best, or third best. So what is available? least worse. Dealing with trade-off may be also the most difficult part of public policy decision. There may be people who lose out, even with good reform. 
at least temporarily, because policymakers did not have the luxury of a perfect outcome. Leaders need to ask the right question, as well as inclusive and transparent in reaching a decision. How will you explain policy impact to the people? How will they be compensated? And will they listen and understand in a complex world where endless information is competing for their attention? People need to sit at the table. They deserve respect, respect and dignity and their voices must be heard. Remember that without them, legitimate policy result will not be achieved. So when does leader and policymaker are really put to the test? Given the complexity of the issue we are dealing with and knowing that the public well-being is at stake, taking decision in public policy is never easy, nor is it simple. Leaders need to show empathy. Leaders need to truly understand people's heart and minds. Leaders need to be able to convince them that the reform is needed and success is possible. Leaders also need to have courage of conviction, be dedicated and driven by a strong sense of integrity. Leadership also means the ability to differentiate between fact and evidence on one side and bias and subjectivity on the other. It means managing every process inclusively and making choices wisely and responsibly, no matter how hard this seems. In the field of public policy, even more so in the position of leadership, success is defined solely by how the people who are affected by the work we are doing. Their success is uh, our success. Public service is not about personal glory, but about common good. In fact, the cause of change is often immediate, but the resulting success can be delayed and people may not remember a leader's contribution by the time it arrives. Leaders and policymakers must always choose what is in the best interest of the public. And leaders and policymakers always have to remember that sometimes not everyone will appreciate your decision. Some may misunderstand your action and others even misrepresent it. But if you act with full integrity and without compromising of fairness, and if you act with honesty, humility, and respect for the dignity of the people, a still very confidence and belief that you always come out as a winner. For the leaders and policymakers of tomorrow, it is also imperative to keep your eye on the ball when it comes to technological transformation. Nations must rethink about their approach to rapid digital transformation, so the gap that separates them from developed countries does not become unbridgeable. The good news is that technology is not only a threat. It will also bring new pathway to prosperity. The digital revolution represents developing nations with a huge opportunity to fast track their economic development, delivering better public services and create an inclusive economy and thriving society. For these countries, there has not been a moment as fraught with with possibilities since the post-war manufacturing boom that propelled the so-called ASEAN tiger to prosperity. So emerging economy must be proactive. They cannot simply allow technological change to wash over them, leaving citizens to adjust on their own. Without careful planning, far too many will confront job losses from automation growing inequality, and also entrenched poverty. Policymakers need to advocate for a shared national vision to be digitally ready. Effective coordination between government, company, civil society is critical. It all began with ensuring access. 
Indonesia, we have already completed our project of Palapa Ring. This is to bring fast broadband internet infrastructure to both urban and rural citizens. For those of you who only familiar with Singapore, maybe this is not a big deal to wire the whole area. But believe me, if you step out from outside Singapore to fly to Indonesia with 16,000 island and, 300, and 267 population in 540 more district, 34 provincial area, that's a humongous task. So technology has become an enabler for human life. It creates opportunity and access for many people as well as businesses to be more productive and efficient. In the context of economic development, technology is one of the main drivers for growth and prosperity. In addition to improving efficiency and productivity, and for us in the Southeast Asia, 360 million internet users is the most population with the most engaged mobile internet user in the world. That's a big market. 2019, in 2019, the Southeast Asia internet economy valued 100 billion and projected to triple to 300 billion by 2025. But to maximize the potential of technology for the economy, it should be available for everyone. Otherwise, technology will only widen the gap and worsen inequality. And that's why technology should bridge the gap and promote equality through the access and the infrastructure that need to be built. Leaders and policymakers in Asia should give higher attention to this digital technology phenomena and trend. Various aspects should be well managed such as ensuring flexible new regulation, reliable infrastructure, data protection, and access to capital. Indonesia can be a good example of how tech unicorn grow rapidly compared to other country. Recently, we also have been rising, we also see many of those geopolitical tension across the globe, which creating additional risk for all of us. Political and geopolitical uncertainty erode investor confidence and can drive volatility in key commodity prices of the world. We see the riot in Hong Kong is an example of how such situation can lead to the economic recession, but even worse, maybe the future is at stake. There are various causes of such political tension and protests. Thus, it's important for country to have a strong, credible, and clean institution framework that is trusted by their people. Let me let me now take this opportunity to update you of my own country. What is the Indonesia under the elected the second term of President Jokowi with the cabinet in the priority of our policy to reach our aspiration to become a high economy. Indonesia economic transformation is based on three pillars, infrastructure development, human capital development, and technological adoption. We continue to strengthen our institutional capacity and improve our governance standard. We believe through this combination of factors, we will increase our competitiveness and pave our way to become an advanced country. In the past years, we have been very rigorous in accelerating infrastructure development. We also make a very difficult decision back in 2014 of reducing energy subsidy and put this fiscal space to reallocate for productive spending for infrastructure development and social assistance. Our structural reform strategy 
also emphasize on the strengthening the quality of our human capital. We have allocated 20% of our annual budget for education and formulated an education policy framework to support human capital development. On the new cabinet, the new Minister of Education is the youngest, only 35 years old. So you can imagine how I feel. <laughs> when the inauguration, he just really like stand next to me. I know him when he was undergraduate. So he called me auntie. So we discussed quite a lot. But this is just a wake up call for me to say that Encouraging to see a new generation coming in the policy uh, makers in Indonesia. With that, we are going to rely on their perspective because they are the one who's going to actually face with a lot of challenges, whether this is driven by technological change, climate change, or even the dynamic of the society. So it's really good for us to see the new lineup of this cabinet which is younger and they have confidence. They also have an experience and they also have specific idea in their mind to deliver a better education, health services, social safety net, as well as to transform the economy. So education and health are the two most important to reshape our human capital inclusively. We currently also work to improve the health indicators. Besides many cases of success story in Indonesia, we have to be also reminded that there are still high prevalence of stunting cases in Indonesia. It's around 26%, more than a quarter of children which is stunted. The government has put in place a coordinated effort by national and local government to identify where they live, how they behave, and how we should intervene. We do hope that this coordinated policy will reduce the prevalence of stunting for our children. But public policy is not only thinking about how fast the economy should grow. We also have to think how equal the growth could be enjoyed by all people. A rising tide must lift all boats. We also can relate the importance of equitable growth to promote peace and sustainability. Some say that there is a link between the rising political tension in many countries recently with the increased level of inequality or at least less inclusiveness of the process. Over the, the past decade, Indonesia has shown itself as a constant, consistent economic performer, both measured in growth and stability. We are growing at the average of 5.5% since 2003, and our Gini coefficient has been constantly declined. But we also understand that we should continue to improve the pro prosperity and equality. We continue to increase our budget allocation to strengthen social safety net in order for us to be able to create a more flexible labor market, more productivity and flexibility in our real economy. Our policy to promote equitable growth has resulted in improved people welfare in recent year, but Indonesia is still ways to go. And that is why we will continue learning in this process while at the same time try to continue achieve uh, progress along the way. I would like to close by my hope through today's event, but about there will be deeper discussion in how Asia can thrive and how policy settings should be implemented. Asia future leaders should be well equipped in anticipating the challenges and capitalizing on the opportunity I have highlighted above. I would like to again congratulate 
the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy for holding this inaugural Festival of Ideas, which coincide with its 15th anniversary. I wish you continued success in training the future leader of this region. I would like to close as a fourth term, maybe it's not really fourth term because not all of them is really fourth term, but it has been like fourth term cabinet finance minister. This is a luxury actually. I have quite a lot of friends from Latin America. They say that the job as a finance minister usually never survive more than two years. <laughs> so I will, I will close by saying as a fourth term finance minister, I can credibly say that the experience as a public officers, public policy makers, by saying that for all of you, the young, aspiring leaders and policy makers, especially those in this audience, never settle for the ordinary and get rid of business as usual attitude. Effective leadership requires constant innovation and new ideas. Please be passionate about what you do. Always consider it an honor and privilege to be given the opportunity to serve others in your community, in your country, in your regions, or in this planet. Always give your best effort. Finally, humanity is in a dire need of leaders with passion, integrity, humility, and competence. Listen to the voice of the people never shy away from the challenges. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Sri Mulyani, for an amazing lecture, so rich with different ideas. Um, I want to involve the audience in conversation, but I can't help first reflect on a number of themes that ran through. The first theme, was a, a reflection on the world out there today. The increasing access to digital information that we have, but at the same time, people don't yet seem to fully leverage all of this rich structure of ideas to be more open-minded. Mm. And there are issues there that you know, we, can, we would like to try and, and ask you about. There was a second reflection, which was really a very kind message from you to our students and the school in general about leadership, mm. the qualities for leadership, the humility, the technical competence, the need for serving the people. Uh, there was, I thought, a, a wonderful tapestry of you know, the things that schools and training can do and the learning on the job, as it were. Mm. There was a third theme which talked about the state of Indonesia's economy. You have played such a critical role in bringing up Indonesia's economic and financial development. So many insights from you. And then a closing, which has a broad reflection of some of the grand challenges there. And again, coming back to the lessons for those of us who want to become public servants and who want to take on political leadership. So as, as questions begin to come in, and I hope that people will begin to, to uh, so I will see the questions on the screen, as it were. But I thought we would begin, as the, the, the screen comes down, I thought we could begin by, by asking you of the lessons on leadership. Okay? I, hope, I hope it's okay I ask you something, maybe a little bit of a personal reflection. Mm. Because you, know, you have couched your presentation in terms of that personal reflection. One of the questions that our students always ask us is, you're teaching us economics. You're teaching us political science. You're teaching us, oh God forbid, statistics. Uh, your own background is one that took all those learnings. Your doctorate is in economics, is in technical economics. So you took all those learnings. And from that, you crafted your own narrative of leadership, of personal political leadership. And I would like to see how you, your journey, can be used to help our students think about how they can take their journey on political leadership. Because they, all, they often say, oh, 
you are not teaching us about political leadership. Well, you have gone through the technical competency route, but you have come to a very, you have come to such an assured, uh, secure, and, 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 and commanding position on political leadership. What were the formative events in that journey for you? As I said, I think a leadership that first require a competent, but definitely with many of what you call democratization as well as the ability to move upward, you most of the time you can also find that somebody in a very, very important position and they don't have any competent or mm. lack of integrity. And that is, exa I mean, what I'm saying here, if your question regarding what can guarantee your success to become a leader, especially at the political arena, you can become incompetent and lack of integrity and you can reach this position. Mm. Because it is obviously now you can see it in many places in the world, right? Mm. But this is not about just achieving or reaching those level. If I define a success, especially when you talk about politics and working in your life as a public policy maker, hmm. I think you define success by saying whether you serve the country or people hmm. better. And that's why the question about what you want to offer to them rather than you are taking in an entrepreneurial way, if I reach this position, then I will take a lot of advantage from that. Right. It's a totally different, what you call it, mindset or mm. starting point. Mm. That is what I call it personal integrity. That is what is your ultimate ulterior motivation mm. to do this journey or to take this, this job. Because as I said, uh, maybe Singapore, which is known globally that you try to constantly establish a merit process. Hmm. Many countries in the world is not having this kind of luxury, if you can call it. And hmm. that's why you can actually can get this uh, uh, situation in which you are going to be very successful even though you are not competent or you are not, uh, you are lack of integrity. Hmm. But in my own personal view also, I train as an economist. Right. I was in an academic, uh, and then there is a fi financial crisis, 97, 98. Maybe I'm not answering, it. you make your own conclusion about my own journey in this case. Hmm. 97, 98 was devastated for Indonesia. As you know that the contraction on the economy is 13%. Yes. Depreciation, inflation, 80%, totally shattering political, social, legal, economic, financial bank. That is what happened in 97, 98. That made the, the President Suharto with 30 years of his leadership end. Hmm. So what happened with those historic moments in Indonesia? Suddenly, we are facing with such a huge devastating situation. Hmm. And people have no idea why it happened, how to respond to that. And the policy making process crumbled hmm. because at that time the executive branch changed. President Habibie have to assume this responsibility in such a very shocking way. Hmm. Parliament is totally dissolved and the new one is not confident enough, maybe that's good. I'm not confident <laughs> that they are then actually becoming more humble and humility because they were accused of rubber stamping in the past. Mm. And public aspiration that they are, they feel that the only and the most important cause of all this crisis is what we call it KKN, corruption, collusion, and nepotism. Right. So the response from that is that we have to rebuild Indonesia new. Mm. And that is exactly the moment that people like me as an academician call to many, many, many this kind of seminar, to the public television show, debate, discussion. I was called by the new parliamentary speaker, parliamentary member, new party leaders, business community. They are all asking what is happening with Indonesia. Yeah. 
and how we are going to rebuild this country. And even at that time, Indonesia becoming so open and democratized, we have a lot of new media. Hmm. So suddenly the new profession, which is very, very blooming at that time, is as a reporter. Hmm. But they don't know how to report. They just know that they need to quote here and there. So I was in that time, is actually try to establish a training for the media hmm. to understand the economic situation. Hmm. What about the GDP? How do you understand about the balance of payment? Why the rupiah depreciates so deeply? Why it is translated to into inflation? How this is translated to the banking crisis? Mm. And what does it mean for the government to take over this bank crisis into bail out? Mm. And that's become a public finance problem. All this is very basic for me, mm. but that is totally new. My understanding at that time, people, regardless where they are, what their position, they need to understand what is happening to our country. Mm. And that made me to become maybe the center of attention together with many other newcomers at that time. And that's why they then treat me like a guru. Yes. Because parties, business, academician, everybody like want to get to know about this. Mm. And it happened to be at that time also, I, I get a lot of information from the IMF team, how they design a program, mm -hmm. how the debate has been happened, why they design it that way. That is something which is very rare uh, for, for Indonesia at that time. So that is a very unique opportunity. But then you can become a celebrity, economic celebrity like myself at that mm -hmm. time, and then just you just gone. Hmm. For me, again, this is more my personal. You feel suddenly that you have this responsibility in your hand. You feel like there is a call. Maybe I come from my own family, which is my parent, late parent. Hmm. They always, from our upbringing, telling that giving and dedicating your life to the country is a noble thing. Hmm. So we started, I feel that suddenly at that time. And then so you go along. You get understand the politician and the politics in hmm. Indonesia, hmm. but at the same time, not just getting to know them, you also try to shape them, and that's why you have the reputation. When at the time that I was appointed as a minister, hmm. that was when I was very young, just like this young minister at the time. <laughs> At least I have the reputation. Yeah. That is a reputation that people have in mind that, oh, I know this person, Ibu Sri Mulyani, and her reputation and explaining and so on. Then a lot of tests that about integrity. Mm. When you are tested by your knowledge and competence is one thing. Mm. When you are tested about the integrity is another thing. Mm. This is about sometimes you have to choose the trade-off. Sometimes you understand there is a politically very powerful people that will be affected by a certain policy. Mm. They then can first lobbying, second, if it is not lobbying, it's not work, that they are going to create political pressure. Mm. If political pressure doesn't work, they even can mobilize people to demonstrate. There are so many things which is a creativity yeah. of the people who try to defend right. their interests. Right. But that is exactly the dynamic that you are going to face and the test. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot give a lecture like what I just did, saying about integrity is important and you never make a difficult decision. Mm -hmm. You really never have a real consequence of your decision mm -hmm. that can cost you personally. Because politics everywhere in the world is always nasty yes. and ugly. Yes. Ethic is, I think, it's never in that world. Thank you so much, Minister, for, for sharing those you know, very, very personal observations. I mean, among the things that you raised, uh, the significance of uh, external events like the Asian financial crisis in 1997, mm -hmm. how that transformed your own trajectory, and then your own you know, sort of contentions within your mind about how to deal with these issues and your ongoing trajectory. Very, very helpful. One of the words you used in your answer was creativity. Mm -hmm. And I've often thought that, you know, how people grow into leadership positions is a little bit like, you know, also how people become creative. Yeah. A lot of it is driven mm -hmm. internally. It's not necessarily something one can teach. Mm -hmm.
Okay, I want to turn to, if I may, the, the, the questions from the audience. Uh, and the, it's the first question, the one that's got the most votes, if I may, because I would like you to, to reflect on this. This is a question about climate change versus the economy. It's about the palm oil industry and deforestation versus Indonesia's wealth creation activity. So one of the things that you said in your, in your lecture was you know, among the qualities that leadership should learn is technical competence not negotiable. Mm -hmm. That gives us the ability to understand trade-offs yeah. and to be able to explain winning and losing. Yes. So this is a question very exactly. much in those lines. So yes. how will Indonesian economic policy, your policy, mm -hmm. keep the balance on the palm oil challenge? Yeah. But looking at this question, then you really want to ask yourself, what is exactly what you try to solve mm. in this kind of question? The climate change is definitely something which is no border. No you borders. cannot claim that this is climate change because of somebody in Java Island transporting a lot or somebody in Kalimantan converting the forest into palm oil. Right. And then uh, somebody in New York going back and forth or burning coal. I don't know. But that is, we talk about climate change is the global problem. Mm. So then we can identify who producing CO2 most and what we could prevent or in this case, is there any alternative for us that can reduce the CO2 mm. that creating this climate change problem. So within that context, I think I will put, and I'm not going to like, limit myself of this climate change and the palm mm. oil industries. Mm. Indonesia is producing CO2, mm. maybe among the biggest. Mm. And within this biggest, forestation is one, deforestation. But actually the other growing is transportation, agriculture, and energy. Mm. So if we genuinely really want to address the issue of climate change within Indonesian context, the government have to make sure that we have the policy to address those issues, which is all equally important. For specific meaning that for transportation, we are now building public transportation, still very early. Hmm. The Jakarta people is just excited now that we in the first time in the history have the first mass rapid transit. Yeah. So everybody like going back and forth riding those and really? Martin, not because of this, <laughs> but it's just, this is really new, I mean, which is good. I mean. But to comfort those people who's riding a car, motorcycle, to ride a bike or to become like those public commuter using mass rapid transit, I, still, I think Indonesia has still a long way to go. Mm. So building the public transportation is become necessary. And that's why I talk about the infrastructure development, which cannot be solved by only government, but also public private. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the energy, Indonesia have a choices, just mm -hmm. like many industrial country, Germany, European, or even United States, they have coal, they have oil, mm -hmm. fossil fuel. Now we have the new technology of the, uh, what do you call it, the solar system mm, yes. and all the renewable like hydro, geothermal mm, and so on. Mm. So Indonesia is also following the path in the past that coal is the most convenient. We build a lot of coal. Mm. And then suddenly now Indonesian Jakarta at least people choking. Mm. Every day our level of the hazard is highest, the worst now. And now becoming public problem. Hmm. And that's why then we are talking more on how, although in what you call it energy plan, we have the energy mix of having a renewable energy, hmm. but the policy settings still need to be strengthened for us to provide more energy. Nice. Now on the palm oil industries, I think this is also in the past, we feel that this is a fast growing demand. So economic forces, was the main driver. Mm. There is an opportunity, and of course there is also governance issue, mm. that converting, providing concession of land and so on, which now President Jokowi really trying to list all who's actually have what, 
mm. who's own or who's getting the this kind of management of land and how they manage this. Mm. It's a long, what you call it, process in the past that ca can and now being corrected through a better governance. I think when you talk about how we are going to make Indonesia policy keep it balanced, that is exactly what we are trying to do. Mm. Better governance on who own what, mm. how they manage it, mm. and then making sure that we can preserve mm. those forests, which is still pristine, and we are going to make sure that they are applying a better governance in managing their estate. I think this is what we are trying to do in making this policy balance. Thanks. Of course, we are going to make sure also that there will be always an alternative for the people who work on this industry. Right. I see. Thank you, Minister, for that very comprehensive question. Mm -hmm. The way that I, you know, I've, I've, I, when, I, when I followed your line of reasoning is that such a question about palm oil cannot be answered in isolation. It has yep. to be viewed against the whole background of global climate change factors, mm -hmm. as well as employment, creating new jobs, yeah. new industries. And so you've got a plan on mm -hmm. all of that. I want to, I, I, I have many other questions, but I want to be democratic and market driven. Okay. So I want to go okay. to the votes here. Okay. So on, on this next question, I, I, I think maybe it's a little bit of a lighter question, lighthearted <laughs> question, okay. rather than the, the heavy one about palm oil. But, What's happening with this move of the capital to Kalimantan? What's oh, yeah. going on? Okay. Uh, I think that's not a light matter. That's very serious. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I didn't mean light, but I mean okay. relatively lighthearted. Okay. Uh, we have studied that uh, how we are going to create more equal equitable growth hmm. across Indonesia. Hmm. And to be honest, when you talk about the political economy of Indonesia, that the concentrated of power, especially in capital city of Jakarta, mm. that's also translated into a concentrated of economic power. Mm. And even though as a finance minister, especially after financial crisis, we decentralized quite a lot. Mm. So one third of our budget now directly transferred to the local government. This is to make sure that now local government, which assume more responsibility, they are going to have the ad adequate resource to perform their public service function mm. with the hope then infrastructure built more evenly across Indonesia and better governance and better services by local government. Then we are going to spread those progress, economic progress. After 15, 20 years, you don't see that. Mm. Of course, there is quite a lot of explanation. The progress of the local government capacity is quite, also varies across the region. Mm. But most importantly is because the fact that you have the concentrated power, pol political and economy in one concentrated area. Mm. Mm. If you look at the environment problem that you are all also asking and concerned, Java Island and Jakarta is sinking because of unsustainable and that's why I think for Indonesia, it's a big country, you should not limit yourself right. only in Jakarta. Right. So we are thinking of all those alternative location. Right. And of course, looking at many other countries who already also have this kind of experience, mm. whether that was the political choice or there's a small tactical choice or environmental choice, mm. but you can see Brasilia, you can see Putrajaya, you can see Canberra, you can see Washington DC. Right. Exactly. There are so many exactly. options that you actually can. So I think Indonesia tried to look at this and this is one of the political decision who tried to tackle all those issues. Equality or creating a, a growth pole which is more even, sustainability, especially on an environment, as well as also in this case that we see Indonesia is a more inclusive. It's mm. not Java centuries or Jakarta centuries in this case. From the political balance point of view, this is also necessary. Excellent. Thank you for that. I mean, this also gets at one of the other questions that had earlier shown up and that you had actually addressed in your lecture, but your answer now talks about this as well, which is how Indonesia plans to, how you 
plan to continue Indonesia's trajectory of inclusive growth. Mm -hmm. Not just your 5.5%, but con ongoing poverty reduction, ongoing decline in the Gini coefficient, which you referred mm -hmm. to. But of course, this kind of spatial rebalancing mm -hmm. is also hugely helpful mm -hmm. to the kind of equalization right. of your yes. society. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. Um, I wonder if we can have time. Do we have time for one more question? Just one more question. Mm -hmm. So if we could, uh, we've answered this question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So we uh, go to, perhaps we can go to what is underneath the screen here. Yeah. Uh, how Indonesia is projected to be the fourth, thank you. How Indonesia is projected to be the fourth largest economy by you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, that's the projection. Mm -hmm. this, you know, this means that our region, Asia, will have already three of the world's four most populous countries, mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. India, and yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, we will also have the largest economies. Mm -hmm. That completely disrupts the global economic landscape, and it will have us rethink what power dynamics look like in this region. So, so I think this is a question that gets you to try and share some of your views, what's going to happen to the power balance in this region. Well, first we have to make sure that the, this projection by the PwC is accurate. Ah, okay. <laughs> that means that by 2050, we have to make sure that all the progress being made is going to be sustainable right. and continue. That, right. That's why we need to invest on uh, human capital, infrastructure, institution, public institution, and policy making process with a better quality. I think we are on that path and we're trying to improve through this now the President Jokowi want to launch the uh, job creation uh, uh, legal mm. act mm. so that it will create more concerted effort. Mm. I think with this kind of consistency, hopefully that we are going to achieve what the PwC is uh, projecting in 2050. Excellent. This is identical with our own aspiration. Excellent. But how, what challenges do you think is going to arise with the changing dynamic of power in this region? I think, as I mentioned in my speech, we are dealing with a multipolar mm. uh, world yeah. now. In the past, it is easier for me. I live in Washington, D.C. for six years mm. during those critical time, the end of Obama era and the Trump era. And to be honest, when I'm now back to Washington until 2016, yeah, when I'm back in the United States, when I talk to all my friends there, I barely recognize United States anymore. Really? It seems like a strange place for me. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what I'm saying that the world order in the past maybe can be identified whether you are West mm -hmm. or East, mm -hmm. or in this case, you can say that West concentrated in United States and their allies, right? And the East can be many, can be China, can be Middle East, can be India, South Asia, and then we have also Africa who's also aspiring and growing very fast. Right. And then suddenly, and then when you talk about this, about the economic or power in the past mm. to become the biggest economy, you have the prescription about how you become successful economy. Yeah. In the past three decades, globalization, openness, trade become the recipe. China, India, reducing of the poverty, like it or not, is because of the globalization and trade, linking them. And then suddenly now those recipe being attacked or becoming as an issue which is not politically sustainable. Mm. And the question is, of course, mm. what is going to happen with all the latecomer mm. or the country which is originally a champion on that, suddenly becoming totally different. I work in the World Bank, and I know that the shareholder in the bank, the biggest is United States. And then the second biggest is the, all the group of European. So you can really see as the bigger, biggest shareholder, they are definitely have an influence in what policy mm. prescription, if you can call it, that need to be advocated globally. Mm. When you talk about climate change, mm. trade, good governance, corruption and that kind. Now gender also right. becoming an important issue. These are all the issue which is for those countries as a biggest shareholder believe that they are good mm. for them but also good for the whole world. And so they are advocating through this 
institution like World Bank, IMF, and so on. And then suddenly, I was sh- the biggest. I'm not our. I'm not r- working in the World Bank anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a governor of the World Bank in this yeah, sense, always... as an owner. Mm. Now the biggest shareholder confused with their own value. Exactly. So the question is, what kind of then policy that can be yeah. seen as a agreement yeah. or at least convergence across 187 country, a yeah. membership of the World Bank mm. or 192 of the United Nations? Mm. Mm. And this kind of dynamic is happening. Mm. I don't know whether Tom Friedman giving you his projection about how this power dynamic will end. Mm. Or even explaining what is happening, it's also another excitement, I think. Hmm. But this is exactly what we need to do. I personally, as a policymaker, I personally believe that is what is work need to be defended. Hmm. But what it works have a certain flaw that need to also be addressed. Hmm. Let's say, for example, trade, global trade is definitely create a lot of prosperity and progress. Mm. Because then you have the competition, higher productivity, innovation, mm. this through this interaction mm. of the people, the good merchandise, flow of people, flow of money, flow of capital, flow of goods. But we also recognize that this, in addition to this benefit, There is also a downside risk. Hmm. In the past, we always think that the winner enjoy, the loser, well, you better take care of yourself. Hmm. And that not adequate. Even a country with good social safety net, hmm. it is not adequate. Hmm. Because changing or suffering from this transformation, hmm. it is not about statistics. Oh, this is the unemployment increase. Mm. They are all human beings, mm. which, uh, as I said in my speech, have the emotion, aspiration, the feeling, dignity. So I think people have to, people in this case, policymaker, business, you, not, you are not enough to think about the winner and make the case of this is right and this is good because we have the benefit hmm. we should be also symmetrical to look at who's the loser and how you are going to make sure that they are adjusting with dignity yeah because this is exactly what happened even the the biggest benefit of trade like united States, they are so surprised with this backfire of this openness Absolutely. with so What kind of response is definitely that you really have to take care of the loser in a dignified way. It is not just about giving the money, compensation, or but this is the equitable sense of progress mm. or sense of equal opportunity mm. have to be created. Mm. I think that is going to be the most maybe logical, but also maybe the most challenging for many policymakers to continue driving with this openness but yeah. at the same time addressing the issue of this minister thank you for that for that answer i mean it opens up so many other domains to be discussed you've provided us a picture of a multipolarity mm-hmm. in the world that's actually collaborative that people are helping each other not the laissez faire unipolarity mm-hmm. system that we previously had uh, that is a wonderful vision and you know with within asean We hope that that's one of the visions that will continue to drive all of us forwards. I think well, I'm going to have to call this to an end. I want to, to first personally thank you for such an amazing uh, collection of ideas you've helped us think through, for taking on our questions with such good nature. Uh, I want to invite this audience, I want to thank this audience for your attention and your participation. I also invite you to join me in thanking Minister. Thank you.